Hello, everybody. Uh, we actually have guests from uh, from several different time zones, so I'm not quite sure whether to say uh, uh, good morning or uh, or good afternoon. Um, just a very short welcome to this webinar on behalf of our Danish Swedish Life Science Cluster Organization, Medicon Valley Alliance. My name is uh, David Munis Stepanek. I am the head of business development and public affairs with MBA. Uh, I hope and uh, and believe that you will all enjoy today's. A uh, very well attended webinar with the uh, the catchy title "How to Transform Your Medical Device into a Compliant Connected Care Solution in Less Than Four Months," co-organized uh, with our member company BioT and Barcelona Health Hub. If you get inspired not only by the content of today's uh, webinar but also by the concept and start to wonder if it would make sense for your company or organization to, uh, to co-organize an inspirational webinar with Medicon Valley Alliance, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you will find my contact info on our webpage, uh, www.mba.org, and it will also appear on the final goodbye slide after the presentation. If you have questions about MBA membership, how to join the MBA networks, which employees of MBA member companies uh, can join free of charge, feel free to uh, give me a call or uh, send me an email. I also encourage you to visit our webpage event calendar, where you will find a number of uh, hopefully interesting online and offline events organized either by MBA or by some of our member companies uh, and partner organizations. Uh, next slide, please. Just a few uh, practical remarks, uh, our household rules uh, for today. It's pretty much standard operating procedure. As you can see, you're automatically muted. You should use the chat, the chat for technical questions only, and then use the Q&A sessions for, um, for questions to our speakers, and then be aware that the um, uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, yes, I guess uh, that's more or less uh, what I had to, uh, to say. Uh, I'm not the reason why you tuned in uh, today. So uh, fasten your seatbelts and, and let's get started. And, and with it, without further ado, over to, uh, to Aline Noisette uh, from Barcelona Health Hub, uh, who will elaborate a little bit on remote patient monitoring, be our moderator and introduce you to Hanan, today's keynote speaker. Aline, the floor, or in this case, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, David, and good morning, everybody. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Aline, and I'm the Chief International Officer of Barcelona Health Hub. So for those of you who don't know Barcelona Health Hub, we are a digital health hub based in Barcelona with international presence, and we bring together the different actors of the digital health ecosystem. And the, the goal is really to create synergies between the different members to advance healthcare. And we do this through events like those, like we call them BHH series in our case, we do them every month around different topics related to digital health with and for our members and also some guests from around the world. And so today we're really thrilled to be co-organizing that, that event together with Medicon Valley Alliance in collaboration with BioT. Next slide. So today we'll cover a very important and critical topic and very happy to see that there was so much um, interest from your side. So we will talk about how we can transform your medical device into a compliant connected care solution in less than four months. Next one. So um, the, the, the agenda of the day. So we're gonna talk about first the importance of like moving the care from the hospital to the home through that remote care, the challenges that are going together with medical device companies. We will cover the big dilemma, like is it better to buy or to build a medical grade IoT platform? We'll also comment on that the benefits of having a off the shelf internet of medical thing platforms. And we will share some tips, um, expert tips on how to choose the best platform. Next. So why is that a big important? Um, so remote, uh, remote patient monitoring, that we've been talking about that even more those past month, they use digital technologies to collect different sorts of, of data from individuals. So that can be like um, different vital signs, blood pressure, um, uh, oxygen levels, etc. 
And why is that important? So that can really help to reduce the hospitalizations, to reduce the time spent at the hospital, the readmissions uh, can also help to have a better overview of a patient's health, like having those data over a period of time. And it can really help the people to actually uh, stay, stay at home and, and not be at the hospital. So uh, freeing also the, the, the hospitals. And also keep in mind that um, remote patient monitoring is a huge cost and time saver for both the hospital and, and the patients. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. So we're here today with um, Anan for, for BioT. So why does it make sense to have them here with us today? So BioT is a fully integrated remote patient monitoring solutions. And so today, if you want to use such a solution, you don't have to build it from scratch. You can actually use one that's already on the market. And that's what BioT does. They offer off the shelf Internet of Medical Think platform. And on the other side, for the providers of uh, medical device solutions, it's a way to quickly and seamlessly integrate into such platform to offer um, remote patient monitoring. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today. We'll tell you more about the topic. So Anand, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, thank you, uh, Medicon Valley Alliance, and thank you, Barcelona Health Hub, for organizing this wonderful event. Thank you, David. Thank you, Aline. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Sophia, the people in the background who worked hard uh, until this second. Uh, and I guess it's up to me uh, to deliver uh, further on. Uh, so I'm glad to be here and I hope to share uh, as much knowledge uh, as possible with all of you. I think we can all agree uh, that healthcare cannot be provided the way it's been provided uh, until nowadays. Uh, corona accelerated that, patients have to stay at home, patients prefer to stay at home, patients feel better when they stay at home and they're not coming to the hospital, but how do you do that? How do you bridge the gap from a medical device that was intended to use by a physician, a nurse in the hospital, and suddenly it has to be used by a patient uh, at home? So we'll discuss all these points. Um, I wonder uh, how many of you are past your second cup of coffee and noticed the supposedly glitch between four months and one month uh, that it takes to connect a device via platform. So there's no glitch. Uh, technology advances. We at BioT are uh, tirelessly working uh, in order to improve our platform and shorten our partners' uh, time to market, which is actually less than one month. But let's let's be. Uh, a, a bit more cautionary and when discussing that. So first of all, what are the adoption barriers that a medical device companies face when uh, coming to market? So it's a long and costly time to market. Uh, obviously, uh, the medical device companies, uh, their know-how uh, can be their hardware, their know-how can be a certain clinical niche, they know how to handle a certain disease, uh, but there are a lot of things that are outside of this domain uh, that they need to pay attention when moving to a remote care or remote monitoring solution. And here we go to the uh, new healthcare world of digital health solution and healthcare data. So it has to be compliance with data privacy rules that keep changing and they are different between country to country. Connected devices pose a threat uh, to cybersecurity. Hackers can and like uh, breaching uh, end devices. And then, you know, from the end device, they can roll into larger databases and cause a bigger mess and catastrophes. And uh, all this data that is being collected, so there's a, a big gap between collecting the data and then you need to process it, you need to make sense out of it, and you need to generate actionable insights on top of that, that's a completely different ball game and medical device companies don't necessarily know or knew how to do that. And when we move to the, to the actual usability of a, of a home device or a wearable device, there is limited adherence of patients. Patients, it's a sort of a paradigm, but they don't like to uh, take care of themselves. And suddenly they have to do that and they have a machine in hand. They don't necessarily 
know 100% how to operate it. They have no nursing background, no medical background. They're just patients. Somebody gave them a machine, explained a little bit in the hospital or in the clinic how to use it. And now they sit at home looking at it and, and kind of trying to figure out what do I have to do with it? And, and all these reasons cause them to uh, adhere less to treatment, deteriorate, and this is not what we're trying to achieve. Uh, there is a continuous need to invest in developing tools to comply with regulations. As I mentioned earlier, and we'll see it uh, in more detail, regulations change. Uh, in a nutshell, it used to be a HIPAA and GDPR world, but GDPR is general guidelines for European countries, and each European country does things differently. So suddenly you need to comply to the Italian regulation, the German regulation, the French regulation, because they do things slightly different. And HIPAA used to be a, a whole a US regulation, but uh, then California a year ago decided that they want to treat patients' data differently, more cautiously. And some states thought, well, that's a good idea. And some thought, okay, well, let's do partially what California does. And now it's a state by state a policy that you need to comply with. And it's not just HIPAA. Uh, and then integration with existing health information systems. Uh, if any of you try to integrate with a single electronic medical record or a single hospital, uh, you know what I mean. And if you try the same EMR system in a neighboring hospital, then not all EMRs are alike. Uh, and, and these are uh, very big uh, things to consider. So that brings us to the big dilemma of medical devices. Do we build a platform to serve this purpose or do we buy one off the shelf? Hopefully we'll have an answer at the end of this uh, webinar. So the complexity and the cost and the time that it takes uh, to develop or to evolve from a medical device to a connected care solution. So there are a few uh, steps that are uh, required. Uh, and, and the first stop in our journey is a medical grade IoT cloud. IoT, Internet of Things, is by no means even closer to IOMP, Internet of Medical Things. And this is for a very good reason. Uh, we're dealing with a uh, healthcare provider organizations on one side, we're dealing with patients' data on the other side. Uh, it's heavily regulated, consumer data is one thing, but patients' data is another thing. You cannot delete your uh, health history as if it was a credit card and get a new one. Your personal health history is your personal health history and it should be highly regulated and highly uh, guarded for a very good reason. Now, you want to connect your devices, how do you do it? I mean, there are plenty of options and protocols out there. Do you do it uh, with a SIM card, via Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 5G? A lot of things to consider. And there are a lot of uh, infrastructures uh, containing thousands of relevant microservices and processes that you need to know about uh, and choose how and which and where. Uh, and these are a lot of decisions, and they are very complicated. Second stop, cybersecurity, data privacy. Cybersecurity is an evolving threat. It's not like a one touch and go. You cannot protect yourself and say, okay, I'm protected forever because uh, it's like the old Cold War. They bring more threats and then the good guys bring uh, higher firewalls or better tools to detect those threats and, uh, and shoot them off your uh, networks. So it's an ongoing process that has to be continuously be updated and it's not necessarily the know-how of your company. Uh, because cybersecurity has nothing to do or had nothing to do until very recently with medical devices. Uh, data privacy, I already mentioned there used to be GDPR and HIPAA, now it's a state by state, country by country, uh, and again, it's an evolving landscape, so all the different parts of the puzzle are moving and you need to keep track of them. That's another complication. Data collection. Uh, you're getting a lot of data from your devices. Maybe you are getting data from third party devices that you have agreements with. But again, what data do you actually collect or how much you want to collect? How do you want to collect? How do you want to structure it, process it, analyze it? How much do you need available for processing or for applying machine learning and how much you want to store just for storage purposes? A lot of questions to ask and a lot of answers uh, to get. Now, you might want to uh, capitalize on that and monetize it, uh, so you need to give access. Again, how do you give access to third parties? 
how do you actually monetize uh, this whole data that you're capturing? These are all very good questions that you need answers to. Fourth stop, remote patient monitoring. So until this stop, you are just connecting, protecting, and building your, uh, your database or data lake uh, over the cloud and, and kind of making sense of things. And now you're facing a patient. And now you have to start dealing with workflows that concern the disease or the condition that you're tackling and the patient that you're dealing with. How do you contact the patient? Which methodology you're using? Are you using a notifications on the smartphone? Are you using an SMS, are you using an email? When do you do that? How do you do that? And, and what exactly do you communicate? Which alerts do you want in place? Do you want alerts that are connected to telemetry or alerts that are connected to the clock? At 8 a.m., you want to tell him good morning, don't forget to take your pill. But maybe at 10 a.m., you want to tell him good morning again, you forgot to take your pill, or you forgot to do your rehabilitation treatment, you forgot to do what you're supposed to do with the device. So a lot of things that you need to uh, ask yourself how and when and which methodology you want to do that. Now, imagine incorporating all these workflows also with the healthcare provider uh, setup because you're not dealing only with the patient, you're dealing with the healthcare provider that is supposed to provide remote care or remote monitoring with your device to the patient in the city or outside of the city, but not in the end of the hallway. You cannot send a nurse to see what's happening with, with that person. And then we're talking about personal patient engagement. Uh, how do you engage? How do you make the patient adhere uh, to the treatment? Or how do you even know that the patient is using the device properly? or adhering to his treatment, and how do you know that he's doing it on time, and what do you do when it doesn't happen? So all these questions are very good questions that uh, you need to uh, ask yourself uh, beforehand and have a good uh, answers to. So luckily, there are a, what is called nowadays IOMP uh, the platforms, Internet of Medical Things platforms that some of them claim to solve some of these challenges that we already mentioned, and some of them will solve all the challenges that we mentioned, uh, but how to choose? There are plenty of those out there, and you need to choose the right one, and it is a long-term relationship because, as we said, regulation changes, so you need to keep in touch and, and see how these things evolve and how you react to that, cybersecurity evolves. You need to stay on top of that and see how you react to that, so you have to choose carefully to which long-term relationship uh, you're entering. So first tip, <clears throat> how to choose the right platform. So tip number one, cybersecurity and regulation. Uh, obviously, the platform providers need to be able to comply with both global and uh, local uh, regulations. Uh, and ideally, they will offload the risks of cybersecurity breaches and a uh, mishandling of data to their shoulders. Uh, that can be done with the uh, data processing uh, agreement. Uh, that basically the platform provider uh, is the data processor and he's the one liable in case of mishandling of the data according to the regulator in whatever country. There is a BAA agreement, a business associate agreement that you want to have in place uh, for cybersecurity risks, which means that the platform provider is the one that supplies the cybersecurity protection, but also the one that carries the liability in case of a cybersecurity breach. And of course, he needs to be insured in order to do that, and he needs to have the capabilities and the right team of experts to provide this coverage of cybersecurity and data regulation. Uh, you're developing medical devices, so you want to have the development uh, history files uh, when you're applying uh, to CE or to the FDA, to the regulator. So this partner should be able to provide those files to you in a very transparent manner. Uh, so there is less work to do when you're applying uh, for FDA or CE. One last thing, patient engagement solutions play a crucial role. So it's beyond cybersecurity, it's beyond connectivity, and it's beyond uh, data privacy. So check if the platform provider can help you already with patient engagement solutions. Second tip, um, collaboration. As we said, uh, the solution has to fit in with the patient, 
but it has to fit in with the caregiver and it has to seamlessly integrate with clinical pathways that will, uh, are already in place that start sometimes from the hospital and sometimes with the same device uh, next to the bed or a wearable uh, in the hospital and then it follows the patient outside to his home. So you need to be able uh, to integrate and ideally uh, your uh, IOMT platform partner of choice uh, will be able to help you doing that. Ensuring that the in-home treatment is as effective as in the hospital, making sure that the patient understands uh, the protocols and the prescribed regimes. Uh, it can be taking a pill, injecting something, uh, or, or just applying a certain therapy, or taking an ultrasound in his hand uh, and sending uh, the video or the pictures over the cloud for assessment at the hospital. Um, you need to make sure uh, that these things uh, are in place. You want to be able to allow the healthcare provider to quickly respond to abnormal events on the clinical side, and you want to be able as a manufacturer to respond to abnormal events on the device side. So if there is a malfunction, you need to be able to solve it quickly, ideally from remote via the cloud, but in some cases you might want to send either a nurse for a very serious situation clinically or a technician for a very serious case uh, or a malfunction with the device. Um, many uh, diseases or conditions can be modified uh, or reverse through behavioral change. So you want to emphasize uh, this behavioral change by engaging better, controlling or monitoring the adherence of the patient and intervening when he goes off track. So if he's missed one treatment, maybe you send them a, a reminder good afternoon, we see that you haven't used the device in the morning, and maybe you want to send them a questionnaire asking them, why didn't you use the device in the morning in order to study the root cause of this specific patient, why he's not using the device properly, so you can offer him a better help. But let's say he's not using the device for the whole week. So I think the physician in charge or the nurse that is monitoring uh, needs to get a notification or an email or a, or a text message uh, listen, this patient is not using the device. He hasn't used it for a week. Check what's happening. Give him a call, knock on his door, send an ambulance. These things have to be in place. Data ownership. So a lot of data is being uh, captured and a lot of data is being stored. It can be from your device. It can be from questionnaires that you send to this patient. It can be third party applications or third party devices that you have agreements with. Who owns this data? Um, ideally you, because uh, you generated the data, you're collecting the data, and maybe you're even training a uh, machine learning algorithms on top of this data to generate insights, both to patients and to the physicians in charge or to the nurses in charge on monitoring these patients. So it becomes your intellectual property, it becomes your know-how, it becomes your value added to the whole ecosystem. Now, if you don't control this data and if you legally don't own this data, then someone can just take it away from you. And then all the work, all the IP, all the machine learning, uh, all the insights that you generated, basically, all your property becomes someone else's property. So they say that data is the new oil. So why give your new oil to someone else for free? Now, there are platforms out there that seem cheap to begin with very low cost of, of onboarding and, and start working with them, but the data side is tricky. So read the small letters in the contracts and make sure that your data stays your data. And if whatever happens and you choose to change platforms or migrate to another place, your data stays with you, your IP stays with you, your algorithm stay with you, because otherwise you just build a business over something that you're going to give away to someone else. Unlock the full potential of medical IoT with BioT. So we explained the connectivity and the importance, and it goes to cybersecurity and regulatory requirements. We explained the importance of collaborating, and you want a platform that knows your customers, knows the healthcare environment or the healthcare provider environment, and knows the insurer environment or the payer environment. So the platform can offer you solutions that your customers would like. 
and most of you will sell to hospitals, a healthcare maintenance organization, some of them would be health insurers. You want a platform that the people know your customers so they can give you more tools to upsell or to look much better prepared when you're facing your customers. And then a predict apply machine learning by yourself or by a third party that specializes in machine learning, allowing you to extract more insights from the data collected and give more value to the whole ecosystem, both to the healthcare provider, maybe preventive data, or uh, according to the data we collected and analyzed, we see that this patient is deteriorating. So you need to do something, send an ambulance, send a nurse, see what's happening with him. Or we see that in the last week, his blood pressure is much higher. Uh, there's an alert, somebody needs to do something, or maybe just send a notification to the patient telling him, we've noticed that you're under a uh, more stress today, please sit down, drink a cup of water, uh, and wait uh, for the cavalry to arrive. And it, it may solve a, a lot of issues and a lot of things. So what I'm saying, you want to go beyond connectivity uh, into collaboration and into a data generation and immediate or real-time or near real-time insights uh, in order to give more value to the patients, to the healthcare providers, and to the whole ecosystem. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you want to reduce time to market and you want to reduce the time to build a, a connected, a collaborative and care solution. Uh, and it can be uh, reduced from one year or more than a year to one month, as I mentioned earlier. It can be even reduced to less than one month. Uh, and our uh, Gen 2, uh, which will be released in a month, uh, has the ability to do that faster. Now, you want to have this solution out of the box. You want a no-code platform as a service environment uh, in order to make your life simpler without having uh, to code a lot of codes and without having to deal with uh, different types of uh, communication protocols, development kits, APIs, uh, and everything that uh, comes with it. You want a platform that already has out of the box a manufacturer portal that lets you see the data that you're allowed to see, aggregated data, anonymized data, for you to bring your own algorithms or develop your own algorithms, but also as an out of the box clinician portal or healthcare provider portal that your customer can get uh, identifiable data, uh, assign these assets to patients, to the clinical teams uh, and run with it. Uh, without uh, uh, having to uh, uh, configure too many things by themselves and without you having to code uh, too many things by yourself. Now, BioT offers that. And we can see uh, the non-coil environment. So it's a drag and drop modular templates and, and algorithms plugin. So you can, there are already healthcare workflows, but you can adjust them to the disease you're tackling or the workflow of interest either by the manufacturer or by the healthcare provider. A code free, no development, drag and drop to customize uh, the interface to your needs. Uh, and it can be needs on the organizational side. You want to update all the devices that are in France because you have a language update or you want to update all the devices with a certain customer because maybe you want to change the front end or maybe you want to uh, put the, the provider's a logo, or maybe you just want to give him a certain upgrade. So you need to manage all that and you have to have the hierarchies in place. So the hierarchies already exist. Uh, maybe you want, uh, and maybe your commercial model is to work via distributors. So you have a distributor for North America or a distributor for Brazil, and you want the distributor to have certain rights uh, to manage all the assets that he's selling in Brazil or in the designated territory. So all these hierarchies already exist. You don't need to code from scratch and build from scratch. You just have to drag and drop uh, and customize it to your needs as you go. You can plug in your algorithms at every point. We supply APIs uh, and basically you can run your business the way you want to run your business uh, on a, an existing vehicle, a robust vehicle. This platform is already running uh, for a couple of years, supporting hundreds of thousands of connected devices of different uh, customers, different regions all over the world. Uh, and, and you basically, the day you start is the day you start. You don't have to wait 
a few months or a year until you can uh, get going. You can instantly integrate uh, with electronic health records, BI systems, data research tools and operation tools. Uh, it's all via plugins. So again, you don't need to bother uh, about that. Home devices, use cases. I, I'm sure that in the audience, we have uh, uh, some people interested in uh, different types of use cases, uh, but we can count on, on uh, patient outcomes, physician follow-up, emergency management, adherence tracking and adherence uh, improvement, safety, uh, post-market clinical follow-up, efficacy analysis, patient engagement, pharmacovigilance, a real-time side effects monitoring or near real-time side effects monitoring with a simple questionnaire. How do you feel this morning after you use the device? Uh, how do you feel this morning after you took the pill? Uh, any adverse events? Uh, and if the patient says, yes, I have an headache, then please read the headache between uh, zero to 10. Now this headache or the importance of real-time uh, feedback, if the patient has a headache, but he's going to meet the nurse uh, or the physician that is in charge of the clinical trial uh, once a month or twice a month, he's not going to remember this headache, but this headache is important. So when it's real time, they remember it and they can quantify uh, the pain. If it's not real time, they don't remember it and there's no chance they would be able to uh, quantify the pain. Um, revenue, remote patient monitoring, more and more payers uh, are, and of course, Corona accelerated uh, this issue. They understand that patients heal better in their natural environment, eating their own food, staying at home. So, uh, and, and they understand that it's much cheaper to have a patient at home than to have a patient in the hospital, not to mention less complication, uh, which makes it even more uh, costly to treat the complication. So there are reimbursements to certain diseases, to certain conditions, uh, but the device, needs to be able to demonstrate to the payer that it has been used to monitor a, a patient or its amount of patients, and the physician has to be able to show the payer that he's been spending X amount of minutes on Y amount of patients a day. And then we're going to the whole uh, CPT reimbursement code issue, uh, and you want your uh, IOMT platform provider to support all those. And it's again, it's a evolving, changing landscape, uh, that can function only via the cloud, but you need to be uh, prepared to ask your IOMT provider to cover that as well. So you don't lose money from the devices that are being used and the physicians who work with you, who chose to work with you, don't lose money for their time that they're investing monitoring. Because if they will lose money, they will change this, the, the supplier uh, and they will choose the competition. Uh, medical devices as a service, uh, these are new business models that are emerging, a sort of a pay-per-click, but for medical devices. So you use it, you pay, you don't use it, you don't have to pay. That can be facilitated only via a, an IOT platform or via connected a device. So BioT facilitates all these use cases, basically stands in the, in the junction between the patient, the clinician, the payer, uh, facilitating all the transactions, data transactions, money transactions, uh, inside transactions. This is a complicated slide that uh, takes time uh, to think. Uh, and this is what's under the hood. That's a platform with a wide plethora of features needed for a successful remote care or remote monitoring uh, device or solution. A platform that keeps evolving to your future needs with more and more features in the pipeline. You own uh, the SDKs, you own the APIs and the full code of the system, allowing you to further customize uh, the system uh, on your own to your needs. Uh, I can give a couple of examples. Uh, most of them were already mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation, but just to put it in context, uh, you want to have a user management feature just to know when the user is turning it on, when it turns it off, uh, and to be able uh, to authenticate the user, that the user that is using the device is actually the user that is supposed to use the device. You also want to be able to match a user or a patient to a physician, which means the patient is using a device that is being monitored by a certain physician, and this certain physician can see this patient's data, but not other patient's data that another physician is uh, treating. 
So there's a double authentication there. A consent management. Consent is a very big issue. There are different levels of consent. A patients need to be consenting uh, that their data would be uh, streamed to the healthcare provider for care purposes. They need to consent for their data to be used for R&D purposes. And they need to consent uh, in order to receive marketing messages or for their data to be used for marketing purposes. Uh, somebody needs to manage all that. In theory, you as the device manufacturers will have to manage that, but if a platform can give you a tool to manage all that, uh, then it saves you a lot of time and trouble. Uh, and basically, the minute a patient revokes his consent, data is not streamlined to point A or B according to the revoke of the consent, and you need to be able to show it to the regulator. So if you have an audit mode where you can show all the revoke of the consent and all the consent that were applied and to what, and actually demonstrate that the data flows uh, only according to the changing landscape of the consent of the different patients, uh, even better. So don't bother, it's included. A uh, multi-region, we discussed, you might want to have a different, slightly different offerings to different regions. You might have different business models to different regions. You might have different business partners to different regions. So all that can be uh, handled through the platform. You want to track adherence and you want to show the patient how well is he doing or how bad is he doing and how many uh, uh, prescribed medications, treatment sessions he missed. But you want to be able to show it also to the physician. And as we said, you might want to trigger an alert if something like that happens too often. You might want to trigger a questionnaire every morning or maybe only when a patient is missing a, a treatment and different alerts can be linked to telemetry, can be linked to adherence, can be linked to whatever you want to link it. It's already linkable out there. You just need to decide a, on your clinical workflow what happens when, and the connections are already there a, and in place. So build versus buy. Hopefully by now you got the idea a, what it means to build such a platform and what it means to buy and what you need to emphasize and to ask when buying a, such a platform in order to make sure you partner long-term with the right partner that gives you the solutions you need and give you a, also evolving coverage, evolving solutions and more and more a, features and microservices on top of the cloud, not for your needs right now, because you know what's happening right now and you know your plans, but you don't know how the future is going to evolve and how a certain disease is going to happen and how it will evolve. And you want to be flexible enough to develop new things in the future. So make sure this thing is in place. Um, of course, building uh, means also hiring the right people to build it. You might already have them, but if you don't have them, then you might want to, uh, I mean, so you have to hire them, uh, you have to train them, uh, and you have to pay them while you train them. So until they become productive, and then you have to run some QA, debug, release a version, release a page, QA again, debug again, these are a, not never ending cycles, but very long cycles that prevent you from getting to market according to your uh, wishful thinking and your business plan. At the end of the day, uh, BioT solves the complexities, solves the headaches of the things that you don't want to deal with, allowing you to focus on the disease, on the hardware, on your device, spending time in front of your patients, the physicians that work with you to understand their needs, their troubles, their pains in order to solve them. So privacy risks, cyber security risks, by contract, DPA, uh, BAA, we touched it earlier, we take upon ourselves, we are liable in that case and not uh, you as a, as a partner or collaborator of BioT, saving 90% of time and cost to market because you don't have to develop things, cutting operational costs and DevOps and everything that goes with it, and, you're, and you can already plug into remote care and patient engagement uh, workflow. So I think uh, the message is 
uh, for medical devices and, and even more emphasize to startups. It's not a build or buy, it's buy or die. Because larger companies might have the pockets to support the building of the platform, but startups, young companies, will not have the pockets to support a, such a large project. And again, at the end of the day, it's time and it's cost. And a, if a platform like that can come ready out of the box, operational from day one, a, at less than a cost of two programmers, and you need more than two in order to make it happen, then I think it's, it's a quite clear cut a, which way to go. I mean, if I would be a, in your position, it would be a quite easy a decision to take. So possible pitfalls. You don't want to exhaust the resources in building a platform. And we've seen companies building their own platform and dying in the process of doing that. You don't want to utilize unre unrefined algorithms. Even if you find some things on open source, you want to be make sure that they're validated, they work, uh, and you don't want to lose time on downtime or apologizing to your customers after uh, you supply the device and suddenly you have a problem uh, in the platform. And you don't want to introduce unnecessary risks. You want to offload risks, put it in the hands uh, of people, companies, partners who know how to handle it uh, and move on, uh, not risk-free, but with a, a lower level of risk. You don't want to lose your focus. You want to focus, again, on managing the patients, the health providers and the disease, the workflow, the clinical workflow. And you don't want to lose the trust of customers. Once you started working and suddenly you have downtime because there are problems uh, in the platform, some connectivity or cybersecurity issues, then you're going to lose your face, you're going to lose customers, you're going to lose trust, and it's very hard uh, to renew trust once you lost it. You don't want to miss on adoption because you are lacking a patient engagement tools a, or, or, or patient adherence tracking a, and activating tools. So better have something in place that is already a, doing that for you or allows you to mold it to your needs, but it's already there. A, they chose to buy. So among our customers, a, our US-based customers, Israeli-based customers, a big customers, NASDAQ traded customers, a multinational companies, as well as startups, a, a, even early stage startups, we know how to accommodate a, companies who are not generating revenues yet or are a, at clinical trials or even before clinical trials. We find a creative ways on the business side or on the commercial side to accommodate to their needs a, at the point in time that a, they are. And it can be an early point in time and we find ways of uh, collaborating with them. A Q and A. a how do we, Aline? A, we run it yes. through you, right? And then, thank you very much. We have a, yeah, a few questions from the audience. So the question: uh, How do you handle governance? Governance. So I mentioned the the, the audit microservice. So first of all. In terms of data handling, BioT is responsible for these things and liable for these things. In case the audit or the regulator wants to audit and see these things, then we have the microservice in place in order to be transparent towards the regulator and show him everything that is done, been done, and how it was done. So again, responsibilities on BioT on behalf of uh, the company that is working with us. Thank you, Anand. So we have another question. Um, so I'll just read the short intro. Along with the medical compliance certified boards and modules, we also need to be careful about the development of control software that is responsible for the data acquisition and processing. Question, to be a certified medical device, is there some standards that should be adapted for the overall device software? Okay, com complicated question. I hope I, I got it right. But when you're developing a, a medical device, of course, there are a multiple standards that uh, you need to stand on. Uh, and when you're using a, a platform, an IO, IOMT platform in order to do so, then 
everything that is related to that platform, uh, the, the platform itself is not regulated because it doesn't have a, a, a use case. It's not used for treating diabetes or, or something like that. The platform itself, but the device, yes, it has a, a specific use, it is regulated. And we as a platform provider, uh, provide all the design history files in order to apply uh, for the FDA or for the CE a regulatory approval. But it's together with the intended use of the whole system, where BioT is the back end or, or the backbone of it. By itself, BioT is not a CE regulated or FDA regulated. Thanks, Anand. So I remind you that if you have more questions, you can drop them in the in the chat. Uh, so one more here. In case of field issues, how is the traceability managed from medical device firmware? to BioT to further layers, if any? Okay, the questions are getting more and more complicated. So <laughs> um, I, I'll answer it from a different angle. Uh, we have a, a photo microservice, firmware updates uh, over the air. Uh, and, and what it does, it allows companies to update the firmware uh, and also as a fail-proof mechanism, they can save the last version while they update the next version. It can work as a push or a pool depending on, on the device and the methodology of their choice. A log is being kept. So again, there is traceability, there is transparency, uh, and a given a, a medical device manufacturer that is using the BioT platform can have a log of all the different firmware updates, uh, when they happen, how it happened in which region of the world it happened, uh, and if needed, you can always go back and uh, revisit those. A BioT is the channel, so the update is being transferred and implemented in the end device. But the responsibility for the update, obviously, is with the device manufacturer. He knows what he wants to update. He knows what he wants to change. Traceability is there, fully, full trace, fully traceable, fully transparent. Okay, so we've got another question. I'm concerned about devices, IT, and cybersecurity, and the constant evolving threats. How do you deal with it? Okay, thank you. Good question. So it's a, it's a real concern. We, we get that question a lot, and it's an evolving concern. As I mentioned it throughout the presentation, it's not a touch and go. You can't say, okay, I'm a bulletproof for cybersecurity, and I'm bulletproof in terms of a IT or data regulations. Yes, you are at the moment, but these things are evolving and somebody needs to keep track of that. Uh, BioT does that for you. We have a super expert cybersecurity team and we have experts in uh, regulations and their job is to keep track with all the threats, keep track with all the regulation changes and do the, the, the modifications uh, necessary in the platform in behalf of our partners. Uh, more than that, we hire third parties to conduct a penetration tests and attacks on our platform just to make sure that we do provide a, the best and the latest protection needed for the platform. And then if the platform is protected, it means all the devices of a, our partners that are connected through the device are protected as well. Okay, um, one more question. What exactly is the meaning of patient engagement solution? Could you give some examples? So patient engagement. A patient gets a device in the hospital and the nurse tells him you have to put it on your arm three times a day, press the red button, then the blue button, then the yellow button, wait for five minutes and then put it someplace in the shade. And then, you know, everybody's happy. It's a very simple solution. And then he goes home. And then it's a black box. We don't know how he's using it. We don't know if he's using it. Uh, and, and if he's using it wrong, it's a problem to help him. So you want to engage with the patient and you want to monitor not only the disease or the condition that he's having, you want to monitor the proper use that he actually put it where he was told to put it and he pressed the yellow button, then the red button, then the blue button, probably a mixed sequence, but that's what happens to patients the minute they finish the, the explanation at the hospital. And you wanna make sure that things are working the way they're supposed to work. So you engage with the patient. 
uh, you send them uh, notifications via the companion app, or maybe there's a screen on the device, ask him how is he doing, is it difficult, is it complicated, how was the first use, how was the second use, how is he feeling after the first time he used it. And you can go on and on with more questions and interact with the patient and ask them, okay, what did you find difficult? Maybe the colors are not clear, maybe the buttons are too small, maybe you can't really read what's written on the screen uh, because the, the fonts are too small, too big, too strange, whatever. And, and this kind of interaction is what helps you engage with the patient, keep him engaged in his treatment. And at the end of the day, it also relates to adherence. He feels that there's somebody taking care of him although there's no one, there's just a device. But that, that's, that's the gap uh, that healthcare has to bridge from nurses that keep visiting patients in beds in hospitals, and then devices that can do a lot of that work for the patient with the nurses or the physician monitoring uh, from the offices or from the hospital, and the patient is at home. So that's what we call patient engagement uh, or, or patient engagement solution. The, the human part of the, the device, the human interaction that is missing because it's not in the hospital and it's not meeting the nurse uh, every time she brings breakfast. Okay, we have, uh, we have time for a few more questions, right? Um, do you also support novel technology that is in stage of observatory clinical studies, a novel device for cardiovascular disease that needs to pass the FDA approval? Is there a way to discuss future collaborations even at this stage? Yes, uh, some of our customers are early stage. They are approaching clinical trials uh, and it actually makes sense to approach clinical trials with a connected device rather, with a, or rather than a non-connected device because then a lot of the data transactions related to the clinical trials can be managed from remote and you don't have to send a nurse twice a week to these patients or bring the patients and have them commute with public transportation or, or their own uh, cars to the hospital twice a week. So uh, yes, we have partners that we've partnered with uh, and they are running their clinical trials already with connected devices on top of our platform. And as I mentioned earlier from the business side, uh, we're flexible on the commercial side to help any company at any stage, even early stage, uh, to start working with a connected device, even better if there will be four clinical trials, better for them because it's gonna save them a lot of time and money already at clinical trials. And, and as I mentioned, it's a long-term relationship and we believe in long-term relationships. It's not a touch and go. There is an ongoing evolution of the medical device manufacturer or the digital health solution provider and BioT together, they grow alone, they grow together, and, and there are more synergies, uh, obviously, along the way. We can then help them scale. Once they go to different countries, the regulation changes, the, the, the language changes, a lot of things change, and, and we can help them grow uh, all along their path. So, and then we have another question related to uh, FDA. How important is it that an Internet of Medical Thing platform that eventually brings data for clinical decision support be itself FDA approved? Okay, the platform itself doesn't have to be FDA or CE approved. It's a generic platform, a kind of a dumb platform with no intended use from the clinical point of view. What has to be approved is the overall medical device that relies on that platform. So the whole concept, the whole solution, uh, be that digital or with hardware, has to be regulated. But BioT by itself doesn't have to be regulated because it supports a, a multitude of use cases. It supports a multitude of customers, different use cases. Therefore, uh, it doesn't have to be regulated or FDA regulated, to be more precise. Okay, and then we'll take one last question. Um, is embedded machine learning employed by BioT to make sense of the data? So it is on our pipeline to provide more tools. And some of these tools are machine learning algorithms that help make sense of all the telemetry data that is arriving, like digesting it, make a little bit more sense rather than just continuous data points. Uh, so it's in our pipeline, but uh, companies don't have to wait for us. <clears throat> if that's their know-how, then they have their own data. They can apply their machine learning algorithms 
and if they want to contract a third party that specializes in, in uh, data analytics or data science in that regard, then we'll provide the APIs, third party will have access to the data of that medical device uh, manufacturer, uh, and, and then we'll be in charge of shipping the insights to uh, whoever uh, the device manufacturer uh, wants to send the insights to patients or caregivers. But obviously, that, that's, that's where the market is going. Data alone doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, machine learning helps to make uh, more sense in that. Fantastic. Well, Anand, thank you so much for that presentation today. It was really, really great, really, really insightful. I guess people could get in touch with you if they want more information or really sure. talk about their, their personal cases. Yeah. And maybe before giving the floor back to David, um, Anand, do you want to say like um, closing remarks? Uh, the door is open uh, for questions, not only for business. Uh, if you have a question regarding where you are and where you want to be and what's the best way or the most efficient way of, of getting from your point A to your point B, we're happy to talk. Uh, we don't charge for talking, so and we like talking. So be my guest, send an email or, or find us on the internet, uh, any means possible. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank, you Thank you very much. So before giving the floor back to David, just two small words from my side. Uh, so Barcelona Half Up will be back um, in November for our next BHH series, all the information on barcelonahealthhub.com. But in the meantime, we have two important events coming up next week on the 28th, 4 p.m. CT. We have our annual e-health investment forum. So 10 startups in AI and healthcare will pitch in front of investors. So you can follow that event live. And then 28th of October, a month later, we have our annual um, event, Barcelona event, so the BHH Summit. And the topic this year is the patient journey of the future. So, so very exciting topic. We will talk about uh, patient remote monitoring, like we talk about today, and more things like liquid hospital, data, the patient journey, like healthy patients, chronic patients, etc. So you can find more information on bhhsummit.com and you, you can book your, 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 your free ticket there to attend the event. So thank you very much for being here today. And David, I give you the floor back. Thank you very much, Aline. And then it's just for me to say uh, goodbye and uh, hopefully see you later uh, on behalf of Medicon Valley Alliance. Uh, I hope and truly believe it's been a time well spent and that you have appetite for more MBA events, but also more uh, Barcelona Health Hub events and more BioT events in the future. And as mentioned earlier, feel free to reach out to me if you want to know more about this and other Medicon Valley Alliance event concepts. Um, a big thank to, to, to you, Aline, and you, Hanan, and uh, of course, also my own team, MBA team, uh, who together made this webinar possible. And I guess with, with that said, uh, I think we have uh, reached our destination, so to speak, and uh, I will conclude this inspirational webinar and um, take care out there.